Folk Tales, a night night series showcasing Jamaican fables. Some duppies are kind, some duppies are frightening, and some come to punish the wicked. This is the story of Kobe and Mr. Brown. It started one hot August night when Kobe got off the plane in Montego Bay. It was a Caribbean Airlines flight from Miami. Though what Kobe had been doing in Miami, nobody knows. The airplane taxied up to the terminal building and cut its engines. The lights from the terminal were shining on the concrete runway and the gleaming silver airplane. The passengers descended the staircase and walked across to the terminal building, hair and skirts blowing in the warm sea breeze. The plane was deserted, though the door was still open. Then, Kobe came out of the airplane. The first person to see him was an airport worker unloading the luggage. Then the pilot looked out from his cabin and saw Kobe. The passengers who were standing in a line waiting to go into immigration, they saw Kobe. And a taxi driver leaning on his car, looking at the plane, saw Kobe. So many people saw him that he must have been there. Everybody remembers Kobe a little differently. Some say he had long, long fingers and some say he had claws. Some say he was sweating, and some say he was dripping blood. Some say he was bald-headed, and some say he was wearing a top hat. But everybody agrees that Kobe was a crow, a John Crow. Big as a man, walking like a man, a giant vulture dressed in a black suit and pushing an empty coffin in front of him on a trolley. Kobe pushed the coffin across the runway to the terminal building. He pushed it past the passengers standing in a line. He pushed it, the trolley wheels squeaking and complaining, right past the immigration officers and into the customs hall. In the middle of the hall, Kobe looked slowly around. One red eyelid slid down over his black eye and quickly back up again. And he turned his head completely in a circle, looking at all the passengers in turn. Then, Kobe spoke in a voice like the rattle of nails. Where is Mr. Brown? said Kobe. Nobody answered. Where is Mr. Brown? He repeated. Then Kobe pushed the empty coffin out of the hall, out through the doors, past the donkey carts and the waiting taxis, out into the dark Jamaican night. So many people saw it. It must be true. The next time anybody saw Kobe was some time after that. Nobody knows exactly how long, but everybody knows where. It was at Bamboo Walk. Now, Bamboo Walk is a stretch of road in the middle of the island, which is shaded out completely for more than a mile by tall bamboo trees. The bamboos grow on either side and lean over to meet in the middle. It is cool in Bamboo Walk, and the shimmer of the leaves and the clicking of the bamboo stems make your eyes go bleary and your mind go dim. But the two men saw Kobe just as plain as day. They were driving a truck, carrying a load of yams and potatoes into market. They saw Kobe pushing the coffin right down the middle of Bamboo Walk. They had to slow down to pass by because Kobe was hogging the center road. 
And as they passed, Kobe looked up at them and said, Can you guess what he said? Where is Mr. Brown? What? said the driver. What do you say? He didn't wait for an answer. He drove away as fast as he could. From far away, they heard the voice of Kobe calling after them, a hollow voice like the rattle of nails in a glass jar. Where is Mr. Brown? The two men in the truck didn't speak to each other for a long time until they had put some miles between them and Bamboo Walk. You did see it, said one. See what, said the other. Jankra push coffin. Yes, we see it, said the second man. There is a family who has a roadside stall on Mount Diablo, selling oranges and tangerines. They tie the fruit together in strings of a dozen and hang them on a pole in the shade of a tree. The tree they have chosen is on a corner where the road is steepest, so the cars must go slowly. And there is a place to stop. The mother of the family, a stout lady with a round face and a red apron, was sitting by the strings of the fruit just minding her business when she heard the squealing and rattling of trolley wheels. Kobe shot by down the hill, freewheeling, sitting on a coffin with his arms folded and his tail coats flapping in the wind. As he disappeared around the corner, the mother of the family heard the cry of, Where is Mr. Brown? When the word of this got out, a lot of people started to worry. Because if Kobe was coming down Mont Diablo, there was only one place he could be going. And that was Kingston. So all the people in Kingston began to worry, particularly those with the name of Brown. Particularly worried were those Browns who had done something wrong, who had something in their conscience, some evil deed, some wickedness, something boiling in their conscience, and ready to bust like pepper in a soup. Those Browns were afraid that the Duppy was coming for them. Jeremiah Brown was such a man. He was a contractor, building roads and houses, and some weeks before, he had made a man lose his job. That man, out of work and penniless, unable to support his wife and family, had been run over late at night and found dead by the roadside. Jeremiah Brown had that man on his conscience. All that happened before Kobe got off the plane in Montego Bay. So when Mr. Brown heard that Kobe was coming from the west, coming down Mount Diablo, he was uneasy and began to worry. He was working on a nice contract at the time, mending a bridge at Nine Mile, but he handed over that job to his assistant and set off to the east, away from Kobe. He didn't stay in one place more than a night or two, visiting relatives, doing small jobs, but kept on moving east, because every time he stopped, he heard that Kobe had been seen again. And each time he was closer, and each time he was asking the question, Where is Mr. Brown? At last, Mr. Brown could go no further east. He had reached the lighthouse on the eastern tip of Jamaica. So he sat himself down in the shade of the lighthouse to rest and to look at the sea. The waves were breaking on the coral reefs, splashing and foaming, and the debris of seaweed and timbers from the wrecks of ships were washing back and forth across the sand. Over the noise of the sea, he heard the squealing and rattling of trolley wheels. Mr. Brown stood up and moved out of the shade of the lighthouse to look back toward the land. 
Jacoby was coming for him. A black shape, a giant vulture pushing an empty coffin with the blood red sun behind him and a fearful voice calling. Where is Mr. Brown? Mr. Brown looked for the last time at the beautiful dark mountains of Jamaica and at the setting sun. Before him was Kobe and behind him the eternal sea. Mr. Brown turned and ran and dived into the water. That was the last that was seen of Mr. Brown and of Kobe. But from that day to today, Jamaicans don't like to put anybody out of a job. The end. I hope you enjoyed that story. And as always, until next time, happy reading.